Welcome to 2000's Titan AE Review and Thoughts film. I realize this video is long. If you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies I watched, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler, so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the video itself, the video itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers to the subject, including discussing the ending. Now, so, yeah, the MPA rated this PG, and the video is for those above that age. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. I streamed this and thus didn't pay extra to watch it, so anything negative that I say in this video is not a bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this video are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now, when I'm going to do a video on a movie, TV show, or video game that are not completely new, I try to put myself in the mindset of someone from that period experiencing it for the first time when it originally came out. And... So... Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I've washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, this is only my second viewing. My first viewing was in the year 2007. This is one of those movies that the first time I watched was a number of years ago. I haven't watched it a bunch of times over the years, but that's because I haven't had access to it. It really made a strong impression on me, and I've been wanting to talk about it on camera for a long time. And Thanks to Disney+, Plus, now I have access to it. I jumped at the chance to do this video. If I had been doing videos since 2007, I would have talked about this back then. And same thing goes for if I had access to it in the, you know, technically I could buy it, but I haven't found a really good sale, a good deal on it, and that's why. Now, plot. In the year 3028, Earth is destroyed. Fifteen years later, humanity is on the brink of total annihilation. One young man learns there's a there is a hidden Earth ship that he has to find before an enemy alien species finds it first. So this is yeah, this is an animated action adventure, family sci-fi, and it's it's soft sci-fi, not hard sci-fi made by Don Bluth and you know it's basically an animated space opera I would definitely say it was worth making but I'm aware that some people really disagree with me on this so yeah I looked up IMDb's more like this list almost everything of the of the 12 there are 10 of them are Don Bluth. The remaining two are also animation. Those are Treasure Planet and Atlantis. And yeah, there's definitely some similarities between this and those. I don't watch a lot of animation. So yeah, I'm I don't know the ones that it put on the more like this list. Almost the only animation I've seen was that as a child I would watch every Disney animated movie that was new that I could. So, at the very least, Aladdin through Milan, possibly also Tarzan, I'm not entirely sure of. Now, this movie does try to go against the Disney style, competing with Disney by offering a distinctly different product. Some say that's part of why it failed. People expected Disney from it. It was marketed like a Disney thing. And, let's see. yeah, so the, the one critic says it's highly reminiscent of certain Star Wars sequences, it deems itself to be a bold and grungy action adventure flavor. For sure, it's it's a lot more grungy than the the Star Wars that at least 
prior to this movie coming out, and the ah, what's the word? And and your typical Disney kind of thing. Now, some say that this is superior to the more recent Star Wars films. It was originally going to come out before Phantom Menace. I would personally say I like. Ah, it's close. Overall, I would say this is maybe. Yeah, yeah. I've made up my mind now. Overall, I would say this is superior to the Star Wars prequels, not the Star Wars originals. And. Ah, I'm not going to comment on the sequel trilogy in this video since it came out after this movie. But yeah, there's definitely some aspects where this movie resembles the A, a Phantom Menace. Not once that. Ah. It's right on the tip of my tongue, I swear. A New Hope. In some ways, it resembles A New Hope. Kale is snarkier than Luke, but otherwise does fit that, you know, he, he doesn't know about what's the, the, this, he, he knows very little about the mythology, and along comes Corso, who has an Obi-Wan Kenobi-like link to Kale's father, and he has a personality very similar to Han Solo. Akima is the, the Leia. She even quotes Leia once, and Chewbacca's various traits are given to some of the alien crew of the ship. You know, one of them talks funny, one of them can get kind of angry and aggressive, so, yeah. Now, the title's special significance, the Titan refers to the spaceship, and AE stands for After Earth, not to be confused with A. Originally, the movie was simply named Titan After Earth, but then the movie Battlefield Earth hit like a meteor, and marketing was terrified that people would think of this movie as particularly similar to that, which I really hope not very many people skip to this movie. Battlefield Earth is one of the worst movies ever made. Even if you hate Titan AE, you have to admit, it is significantly, significantly better than, like, at the very most, I know that some people find Titan A to be somewhat bland, and there's a lot of things you can say about Battlefield Earth, but bland is not one of them. From, from that point of view, okay, you might take Battlefield Earth over Titan A, but otherwise, holy crap, that movie nearly broke me. I don't personally know if this, you know, if this is some simply one titan short of M. Night Shyamalan after Earth, because I've thankfully never watched that movie, but I guess it just goes to show that calling a movie after Earth is appealing. I decided to review this because I so thoroughly enjoyed watching it you know, on, on my initial viewing and as expected also on this viewing, even though I knew everything that was going to happen. I hadn't really forgotten anything in these, once again, 14 years. In the interest of full disclosure, I should probably say I first saw the 2 minute 29 trailer, the one with the hire by Creed, in 2000, it was on a VHS copy of some animated movie that I watched a hundred times before my age was in double digits. So I watched this trailer a hundred times. I also listened through Hire by Creed a couple hundred times. I really built up this movie in my head. So when I saw it, and it was pretty good, to me it was amazing. You know, it, on, honestly, if, if the movie had been bad, I would just have been so disappointed, you know, but yeah, it's, it's definitely not, it's not the best movie ever made. It's definitely, it's far from the best animated movie ever made. Don't, don't, eh, don't worry. I am aware that there exists infinitely superior animated movies to this that are not like Disney. 
but yeah, for for me, this has a special place. And that's you know what the wild thing is. I don't even remember what movie it was that that the trailer was. I you know, yeah, some animated movie, at least one of them on the VHS tape, as one of the trailers before the movie plays was the trailer for this, and I no longer have any clue what. Yeah. Now, the dredge, the alien race that are seeking to, you know, yeah, that, that blew up Earth, are beings made up of energy, which is an incredibly cool concept, and the movie makes good use of it. Like, you'll, you'll see sometimes a dredge being will be destroyed, and instead of, like, there being a body with a, a you know, it, it got shot, so there sh it should be... There should be a body with a hole in it. Instead, the energy just dissipates, similar to like if you if you actually watch, you know, it's it's not really something we see in our day to day lives. But if you watch recordings where someone is dealing with a lot of electricity, and yeah, you know, it, it dissipates. It doesn't. It it doesn't really. Yeah, I I think I made my my point. Everything dredge is made up of pure energy. Foot soldiers, outer space dogfight, spacecraft, their queen, all of them. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's a really cool concept. And they, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a movie with a lot of cool concepts. And I wish I could say that the cool concepts lead to more than just a really enjoyable viewing experience, like that they like really make you think or really like stay with you. I can't really make that claim. They, they, yeah. Now, Wikipedia and some critics say that this movie bears some resemblance to anime, so I will just briefly note my experience with manga and anime. I haven't watched very much anime at all. Death Note, which had some good qualities, but really wasn't for me. Numerous Studio Ghibli fair, Ghibli, which are amazing, but not really made for me. Akira, which is amazing, I love it, and the manga, which I did read before watching. For those who cares about that, care about that, and I am subs before dubs, so. I'm not familiar with any of the novels or comics that came out as supplementary material for this movie. I've only watched the movie itself. I wish I could say I came from the timeline where they managed to finish the game and put that out, and I played that, but sadly, no. The biggest problems with it are probably the relative blandness, the fact that it doesn't really bring anything new to the science fiction genre, and there are definitely at least a few plot holes that you kind of just have to pretend aren't there to fully enjoy the movie. I mean, I already, I compared it to Star Wars. There are many other comparisons you could make. And I'm, I'm not going to. I, but, but you could, hypothetically. Now... Yes, yeah, so, briefly quoting a fellow critic, Titan A.E. comes through where it counts in the big picture. It will fascinate anyone old enough to read comic books, and with its dark undercurrents, sudden reversals, and confrontation of an uncertain future, teens probably can identify with it. I would definitely say, I'm, you know, by the time I watched it, I was no longer a teenager, but I think I would have really gotten into this as a teenager. And, right, and another fellow critic, Titan A.E. gains substance from the idea that there is no reason to assume that the human race will continue throughout eternity. Now, let's see. So, this was written by several people, which already is not a good sign. Okay, I'm just I'm just briefly gonna go through. There are there are some things that the people who wrote 
who helped write this movie. There are things they also wrote that I watched. Some of which I really don't think very highly of. Hans Bauer, who also wrote Anaconda. Randall McCormick, who wrote Speed 2. Ben Edlin, I don't know anything else by him. John August, who wrote Charlie's Angels, Charlie's Angels Full Throttle, and Dark Shadows. He did also write Corpse Fly. That one is good. And Joss Whedon, and yeah, yeah Joss Whedon, everything I've watched by Joss Whedon that, that he wrote. Yeah, I, I don't hate anything I've watched that Joss Whedon has written. Toy Story, Alien Resurrection, Cabin in the Woods, The Avengers, Avengers Age of Ultron, Justice League. You know, obviously Justice League has issues, and so does Alien Resurrection, but the other ones I love. Well, I respect Toy Story. I don't love it. And, you know, not really into... Not really into animation, not really into movies made very much for kids. The movie does a good job of giving a brief glimpse into a fascinating world. Like, there are a lot of things that you only briefly see, and some people consider that a bad thing of the movie, but there are a number of things in this movie that are only there for, like, one scene. And you understand why it's not there in other scenes. But, like, I'd watch an entire movie that just expanded on that one scene, on the, the living things in that scene, the, the planets or, like, outer space phenomena of that one scene. Now, the movie handles plot twists fairly well. There are not too many. They're not bad. They're not too few. Some people say it's too easy to figure out for the viewer. It is not difficult to keep up with the twists, even on the first viewing. The direction is fairly focused, and this was directed by Don Bluth and Gary Goldman. And I haven't seen very much else. I mean, they both made Anastasia, I watched that, and Don Bluth also created The Land Before Time. I'm not sure he had very much to do with the thousand sequels that that movie has. I, I don't think I watched past the second one. But yeah, you know, the, the first Land Before Time and Anastasia are fairly good movies. And yes, once again, I am well aware Don Bluth has made some amazing movies that I just haven't watched. And yeah, you know, maybe I will someday, but I don't I don't watch a lot of animation. Now the first shot of the movie is this outer space just yeah, and we get some narration from Professor Tucker as played by Ron Perlman. And he explains why the Titan Project was so significant, and the, you know, and the first scene is literally, you know, we see Tucker's childhood on Earth, he's playing with toys, you know, right before the planet is destroyed, and we see all these spacecraft working to leave Earth, and a number of them are destroyed by just, you know, as, as Earth is blown up, like, debris will fly out, and, yeah, you know, we don't get, like, numbers, but we, the opening shows us Earth blowing up, several ships full of human beings just trying to survive Earth blowing up, being destroyed just randomly, like, they weren't, you know, it's not, like, some, some people think that if if you mess around with something dangerous, it's your own fault if something happens. That wasn't the case here. These are just completely regular people. And I think there is a decent argument to be made that some people, like, I can imagine, like, parents took their kids to see this expecting Disney fare, and then they see that, and they just, yeah, I, 
I can imagine some kids watched this and were just like completely like they couldn't believe what they were watching and the fact that the marketing kind of made it look like Disney definitely didn't help matters and that is definitely like you know even even from my fairly limited <sighs> exposure to anime I could definitely say edgy animation that is an anime thing I suppose I yeah to just so spoiling the opening of Akira yes I know only the opening but you really should go blind into it Akira opens both manga and anime open with Tokyo exploding in a nuclear explosion you know so that and earth blowing up you know, I mean, they're basically cousins, these two intros. No more spoilers for Akira, for the time being. The opening does a good job of setting off how devastating the loss of Earth is and bringing us into Tucker's existence before the events of the rest of the movie. And the, the like, you really get... You get a sense that Earth was important to Kale, and that his childhood is now just this distant memory, and he's really jaded because, like, it, it would be one thing if he never had any, but he used to have a happy childhood, and then Earth blew up, and humanity are refugees, are, are you know, no, nobody respects human beings out in space because we have no home planet, and... We, we are so scattered across, just, yeah, and at, you know, when the movie jumps 15 years ahead, you know, it's interesting that people say that, oh, you know, Kale is like a teenager, but he actually, at the very start of the movie, maybe it's not that interesting, but I'm going to finish my thought here. At the very start of the movie, he says that he's, let's see, was it older than four or older than five, and then jumps ahead by 15 years. Okay, I guess technically... He might be 19, so on the very edge of, but anyway. When we catch back up with him, he's cutting apart large space, you know, yeah, like spa space ships or something, so that, like, he's, he's, a, he's a salvage worker or some, something like that, you know. It's not... It's it's not exciting. It's not you know okay. It's not it's not not cool because he's got this thing that can cut through steel, that can cut like really far through steel and you know. But it's it's not it's not what he wanted. It's not what he wants. And the opening titles do a good job. They capture the the sadness of losing Earth. So I'm not. I'm going to briefly talk about the ending. I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending, happy ending or a sad ending. It fits with what came before. I'm happy with how the movie ends. I think an argument could be made that there's like... Not really deus ex machina, but some convenient writing. Some people... I, I would say that the, the ending has some surprises for you, and they're, they're good surprises. Now, the, the ending titles let you sit with the ending and leave you with the same emotion as the ending causes, which it can be kind of awkward sometimes when a movie ends in one way and then the end credits start playing and it's a completely different mood. The movie does not lose your interest along the way. Now... The movie subverts expectations some. There's... You know, I actually... I heard some other people talking about, and they would mention like one or two, and I could remember maybe four total, but overall there's probably at least half a dozen or more 
of like, yeah, cliche dodges, expectation subversions, and yeah, I, I don't think the movie completely gets its due dues for how how yeah clearly you know the the script screenwriters did try to make sure that you couldn't see where things were going and you didn't you wouldn't be able to just figure everything out as a now given that it's this space story you know there are spaceships there are guns that are incredibly powerful there are aliens you know there there are abilities and traits that are very outside of what human beings can can do they do they they came up with some some fun and interesting ones and they use them fairly well in the movie I would definitely say that the the cast of the movie understood the their characters. For for some of the characters, you're not gonna you don't get a lot of information. You don't get a lot of backstory or development or such. So you know if that means that you can't get into the movie because of that, this might just be a movie you won't be able to get that into. Now, I don't know that I would say, I, I think you, it does a decent job of eliciting some empathy for at least some of the characters we're meant to care about. I mean, if, if we feel a hatred of the villains, it's really mainly the concept of them blowing up Earth more than their personality or their depiction otherwise. But then, you know, that is the first, the, the thing that really defines them before anything else is the fact that they, they blew up Earth. Now... Not everyone thinks that there are any likable characters in this film. I, I do think that there are some likable characters. But. And yes, I do prefer when voice work goes to voice actors, many of whom work for a really long time. They have to take any work they can get, rather than big Hollywood names who can pick and choose. With that out of the way, I do think that this movie is well cast. I think they made some smart choices in who plays what the cast do give great performances, even if you don't account for them not being voice actors. Like, the first time I watched it, I don't think I was that... What's the word? I wasn't very conscious of the difference of, like, that the, the fact that there are some actors out there who only ever do voice acting, and that, you know, they thus have to really nail, you know, a lot of, I'm aware today, there are a number of performances, voiceover performances, by actors who are used to being able to act with their entire body, and they have trouble acting through only their voice, and, yeah, you know, thankfully it, it didn't, that wasn't the case here. You know, I, I don't think it surprises anybody that John Leguizamo, that John Leguizamo can play a marvelous weirdo alien. For sure the characters could have been more well developed, could have more focused put on them. So, getting into the specifics, Matt Damon plays Kale Tucker, a yard salvager, and yeah. He delivers some great Joss Whedon snarky dialogue. 
he misses Earth, which is easy to empathize with. We've all, we've all lost something we wish we could get back. Roger Ebert, R.I.P., used to say that movies are empathy generators. I would say that's especially true of, among other actors, Matt Damon movies. You know, I just... Let's see. Not yesterday. Just a few days ago, I rewatched The Born Identity. Since I'll be watching... No, I haven't gotten to watch... Black Widow yet, but I will soon. Yeah, it's not a surprise that I'm rewatching Matt Damon's Bourne movies in preparation for watching Black Widow. There's definitely going to be some resemblance there. And, I mean, in the Bourne identity, for a lot of it, he has no idea who he is. And you would think that would just make him a blank slate. You would think that would make, like, you think that would make him impossible to empathize with. Everybody knows who they are. Like, like, actual amnesia is extremely rare outside of fiction. You know, most people don't know someone who has amnesia, and yet he manages to elicit empathy. And with that said, there are still some people who found that they did not empathize with Kale. I'm not one of them. He's introduced playing as a child right before Earth is destroyed, and, you know, 15 years later, he's much more mature. He clearly had to grow up quick. Now, let's see. So... Right. According to IMDb Trivia, Matthew Broderick, Jean-Claude Van Damme, and Christopher Reeve were considered for the role of Kale Tucker. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I really don't think that they would have worked anywhere near as well as Matt Damon does. Yeah. I, I'm really, really glad that they didn't. I don't think that there's some hidden significance. It's probably just random, but Kale does look a lot like Dimitri from Don Booth's Anastasia, and where that is a movie where that character tries to convince a young woman that she actually is this incredibly important person, this is a movie where that character is told by someone else that they're actually an incredibly important person. So, I don't know. Is this just how Don Bluth draws a character if they're involved in a revelation that the character themselves or someone they encounter is actually an important person. Yeah. Alex D. Lenz plays young Kale Tucker. Now, he also voiced young Tarzan and Tony in the... Right, in, in Disney's Tarzan. And Tony in the Cable Guy. Is that... Is that the child version of Jim Carrey's character in that? A anyway. He's also in Home Alone 3, which for some reason I've watched multiple times. I don't know that he was like the best child actor ever, but he does a pretty decent job in this. And from what I recall also Home Alone 3, it Tarzan, I don't know that I've watched that since it first came out, so I couldn't say. And Cable Guy, I'm not even entirely sure who he plays. I, is there even any other kid than, than Jim Carrey's character? And anyway, if, if I was going off that, then eh, his performance is, is fine, I guess. It's, not, it's nothing special. He's not given a lot to do. I'm not saying it could have been, but... And Bill Pullman plays Captain Joseph Corso, a former soldier and captain of the Valkyrie. Now, let's see, it's, you know, it's interesting how, you know, he fights aliens in this and in Independence Day. And, and Spaceballs. He, he gives a good performance. I, 
Yes, I, I will quote a fellow critic. Mr. Pullman's John Wayne-like vocal swagger is just a little too exaggerated for comfort. That's true. And John Leguizamo... I don't know why I suddenly can't say his name. I've been saying it for years. For decades, in fact. John Leguizamo, there we go. As Goon, an amphibian-like repellent and Corso's chief scientist. And... Yeah, he's he's one of the best in, in this. It's... I mean, it just in general, he's really good at playing this kind of weird, creepy type of character. And according to IMDb Trivia, Richard Kind, Austin Pendleton, John Stamos, and Tom Arnold were considered for the role of Goon. I don't know who Austin Pendleton is. I don't think I've seen him in anything. Richard Kind, John Stamos? I'm really glad it's not Tom Arnold. I don't think Richard Kind, John Stamos... I like Richard Kind. I don't think he would have done as good of a job. And Nathan Lane plays Predix Creed Yoa, a fruit bat like a cranium and Corso's first mate. And yeah. You know, he's 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 always great in in you know, he's great in this, he's great in Lion King. Oh, right, he's in Adam's Family Values as the desk sergeant, I vaguely recall. And Janine Garofalo plays Stiff, a kangaroo-like Sagoan and munitions officer of the Valkyrie. And I'm, you know, when I think of her, I mainly think of the Ben Stiller show and the cable guy. Now, let's see. Right, and yeah, quoting a fellow critic, it's hard to hate a movie that features Janine Garofalo as a psychotic space kangaroo. You know, some people joke that they want her to step on them with her massive legs. I'm not sure they're kidding. And Drew Barrymore plays Akima Funimoto, pilot of the Valkyrie and Kale's love interest. And... Yeah, she's definitely got the, the kind of attitude that we're used to from her 90s roles. And let's see. And I suppose that is pretty much. Yeah, so those are the cast members that I'm going to comment on. So, let's see. The, yeah, the movie doesn't really give a lot of development for the villains. We don't know why they're doing what they're doing other than this vague idea that they think mankind is too dangerous because of what we can create. We don't know what they think would actually happen if they stopped trying to destroy humanity. YouTube reviewer Rabbit Hole Entrance points out that many other animated films do tell you why the villain is doing what they're doing. In animated films, what they'll frequently do is let us hear them explain their reasoning. But, you know, afraid of what humanity might create. Maybe they discover Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, boomers. There is some really good chemistry between some of the characters. I would say Matt Damon and Bill Pullman do a good job as this. Like, Bill Pullman comes in and, like, he knew Kale's father, and he's old enough to be his father, and he, you know, he comes to him and says, there's a, you know, there's a chance that Earth, you know, I, I might be able to get us to the spaceship that your father was, you know, considered so important. So, yeah, there is a little bit of a father-son dynamic there. So as far as the dialogue goes, some of the time characters in the, in this movie talk the way people do in real life. 
I don't think any of the dialogue is basically white noise, but some people do feel that it's excessively bland and obvious. It does convey characterization and exposition fairly well. We see Kale in tremendously varied circumstances, so we see what he's like when things are going well, how he responds to things going wrong, that kind of thing. So the the cinematography was handled. Did I not copy in the name? Oh, right. I forgot there for a second. This is probably not a surprise to animation aficionados, but if you go on IMDb, there isn't technically a listing for cinematographer when it comes to animating. The same for editing, because technically, if you're an anim if you're making an animated movie, if you're animating. Yeah, if, if you're animating basically anything, you are doing some work of a director of photography and of an editor. And because of that, the, yeah. But the, yeah, so judging the, the cinematography based on the animation the cinematography allows us to really take in the scope of the massive space scenes and the editing keeps the action scenes moving fast without it becoming overwhelming. This movie is basically set in a universe where everywhere you go things look incredible. There's a place full of large ice crystals that reflect everything. Many of them move very slowly, and obviously if you accidentally crash into one, you're gonzo. And there's one area where what look like dolphin ghosts fly near you when you fly. Like, they're attracted to fast movement or something like that, they explain it. And then there's this place with a ton of these massive bubbles of, I forget, maybe nitrogen or something, which explode upon contact. Yes. The, the movie combines 2D animation and 3D CG. Now, people who are better at analyzing animation than I am say that the 3D elements are not that well integrated into the, the, the background. And they also say that the frame rate drops for the CG, leading to lag. I... I don't really notice it all that much, but I get, you know, if I really, if I really focus on it, I can kind of tell what they mean. And it is definitely, it is visible. It is, it does affect their enjoyment of the, yeah. And according to IMDb Trivia, when... This was originally, the, the, you know, the, the original director was fired and then subsequently replaced with Don Booth and Gary Goldman. And the studio had already spent $30 million and 18 months on the project with the original director. Everything done up to that point had to be scrapped when Booth and Goldman were hired. Fox gave the new directors 19 months to finish it, a very tight schedule for an animated film. And... That does show. And yeah, so quoting a fellow critic, the strength and weakness of Titan AE, stands for After Earth, is in its animation, which is by turn, turns breathtaking and atrocious. The backgrounds and settings are imaginative and sometimes gorgeous, more often so done 
more often so well done that they are near photographic. But every character is drawn in two dimensions, both literally in the animation and figuratively in the story. The effect is like constantly switching channels between an expensive science fiction movie and the best that Saturday morning children's television can offer. And going into some Wikipedia stuff here, the The, yeah, Bluth and Goldman were inexperienced with the science fiction genre, and the, yeah, the computer-generated imagery is unlike what Bluth and Goldman had worked you know, on previously, or at least there was more of it than usual. And then yeah, and and a number of the a, a lot of films animation had to be outsourced to a number of independent companies. And yeah, the the all of these things combine to to making the movie not as good as it could have been, and not as good looking as it could have been. Now let's see the. Right, quoting a fellow critic here. Locations include the planet Sisharam with its flora of globes entwined by tendrils, red sky and creatures that seem a hybrid of bats and eagles, and, my favorite, the new Bangkok drifter colony. Right, hydrogen. They're, they're, the bubbles are hydrogen and... The budget was between 75 and 90 million dollars and the box office was only 36.8 million so that's quite a loss. A number of you know a number of people discovered it after it left theaters and you know, you can you can find a number of people online, um, a number of other people here on YouTube, who quite like the movie. Now, so the action includes chases both on foot and in flying vehicles, and you know people will shoot at each other. People will try to shoot at the people chasing them. Some of it is incredibly tense, intense, and suspenseful. Now, let's see. The, so, the, the music and score was handled by Graham Revel. And other things I've seen that he did the music and score for include Street Kings, Planet Terror, Eon Flux, the 2005 The Fog, Sin City, 2005's Assault on Precinct 13, Out of Time, Freddy vs. Jason, Daredevil, Collateral Damage. There's a lot. The The... But but yeah, you know, like in, in several of those, he's he's done a number of other like edgy action movies and he brings that sensibility here. Or I guess he brought that sensibility from here to those other movies, since a number of them are from after. But yeah. 
the the score is quite good, although the soundtrack itself definitely, yeah, yeah. Whether or not you like the the soundtrack itself comes down to how you feel about two thousands rock. Since this is an animated movie, all of the audio had to be created. They're not walking around on sets handling props that give off noise, and they do an incredible job. Like, it's something that we don't think much about, except we notice it when it doesn't work. When you're doing fiction that's set in space, if the audio isn't exactly right, then the audience simply doesn't believe that that thing is actually a flying spaceship. We don't believe that that thing is a laser or, you know, this or that other thing. And in this movie, they do an incredible job. Like, they really do... Ev everything sounds right. It, it sounds like something that would work, and that would exist in the real world and would work in the real world. There's some blue comedy and some black comedy. This really did not need to do as much gross-out comedy as it does. There is entirely too much in this movie of aliens suddenly licking humans, or at the very least attempting to, really gross food and other gross-out stuff. You know the movie is made by and for white people when one of the main themes is xenophobia towards and frequent abuse and bullying by aliens of the human main characters who are white. Except of course for Akima, who is Asian in name and appearance, but not voice actor. Like, the same year as this movie came out, Drew Barrymore co-starred with Lucy Liu. I legitimately don't see why they couldn't just have gotten Lucy Liu for this. If I had to guess, I would say the the ah, what's it called? The the star factor, like how much, like there's a lot of you know in 2000, there's a lot of teenagers who would gladly go to see a movie with Drew Barrymore, and not all of them would be as excited if the movie had Lucy Liu, but not Drew Barrymore. The level of realism is fairly high. I'm to be goofs do point out that factual, you know, it's listed as a factual error. The laws of physics take a bit of a pounding throughout. I, that's, a, that's an excellent way to put that. That's, yeah. So, the pacing, if you don't watch a lot of animated movies, keep in mind that a lot of them move much faster than live-action movies. And that is true of this one as well. But it does a good job of, like, there's there's a couple of solemn moments that are allowed to, to hit the audience. And there's a lot of action with a lot of intensity. The movie is an hour and 27 minutes long without end credits and 95 and a half minutes long with end credits and that's also yeah a lot of animated movies that come in are right around that amount of time I'd say it's worth the investment of time it's worth watching at least once all the way through and if you're not interested 30 minutes in the movie probably isn't your kind of thing now, so the best element of the film is the the animation when it's at its best, and I do think that it would be worth watching the movie through all the way at least once just to experience the animation at its best. The worst aspect is the animation at its worst. The worst aspect, according to others, is the soundtrack. 2000s rock. Need I say more? I was most worried that it was going to be too child-friendly and 
I was very happy to see some really mature content. I was most looking forward to the entertainment value and when we exceeded my expectations. And so the trailers don't give away too much. Not not the one minute fifty seven one, not the two minute twenty eight second one. And some people say that the, the trailers made the movie look like a kid's movie rather than a young adult oriented one that it is. I can see what they mean. I'm not sure that I'm good at judging whether, you know, once something's animated, if the trailer... I see what they mean, that it's it's definitely too Disney. The, the parts of the trailer really look like they were trying to get a Disney crowd. The cover and poster don't give away too much, and they give you a decent idea of what the movie is like. The movie does not have a lot of metaphors, difficult to understand elements. There's not a lot of depth or stuff to analyze. You don't need to watch it more than once to understand it. And you don't really need to know or understand very much in order to fully appreciate the movie. Like, it's, a, it's good for you to know like some very basic stuff about like space travel and science fiction but it's it's very basic stuff it's not a it's not an inaccessible movie for these movies i try to judge is the movie is the movie itself or at least part of the movie technically 911 porn if I didn't know for a fact that this movie was made before 9-11, I would definitely have guessed that this unprovoked attack at the start of the movie was 9-11 porn. I guess it's actually Pearl Harbor porn. Now, when I searched on YouTube for videos about this movie, I did find, let's see, was it half somewhere between half a dozen and a full dozen and there were definitely some interesting ones you know some people that hate the movie some people that love the movie and yeah you know it's it's well worth looking around at other critic videos here on YouTube a lot of interesting points made so this has 50% on the tomato meter which is wild to me there are a lot of movies that are much, much worse that have higher ratings. But anyway, that's based on 103 reviews, and the audience score is 60% based on over 50,000 ratings. The critics' consensus is great visuals, but the story feels like a cut and paste job of other sci fi movies. And on Metacritic, the critic rating is 48 out of 100, whereas the user rating is 8.4 out of 10. So yeah, you kind of get the sense that some audiences liked it more than some critics. And the last re when, I, when I checked, the last user reviews were from April 5th of this year. And there are 30 Metacritic reviews and 22 user reviews. So, you know, it could have a lot more engagement. Con considering how many people discovered it. Um, you know, after it first came out. And on IMDb it has a rating of 6.6 .6 out of 10 and an only 404 user reviews. So, once again, could have a lot more engagement. And there were 37 reviews via the IMDb external reviews section. So, the, yeah, the MPA rated this PG. They gave it that rating for action, violence, mild sensuality, and Greek language. And yeah, this is definitely like, it's... They really managed to get away with some, you know... I'm used to seeing a lot of violence in movies, so... 
you know, when I when I just watch it, I'm like, it's not that much. But like when I compare it to a lot of other animated stuff, and again, when this came out, people thought it was gonna be Disney. It's got a lot more violence than you would you would think, and a lot more kind of like like people bleed in this when they're shot and people get shot so in in this movie I mean so that sadly also real life seriously gun control so is this capital C cinema or is it basically junk food? It is basically junk food. I enjoy watching it, but once it's over, it really didn't leave a massive lasting impact on me. Like, off the top of my head, a movie like The Dark Knight, I also enjoy watching, but afterwards it really stays with me. You know, it really, it, it makes me think things. It, ma it makes me, like, ponder things. It makes me feel things on a deep, like, powerful level and this movie like I enjoy it as it's playing but as soon as the credits start roll it's kind of like okay it's, it's kind of like it's kind of like with a video game like it's fun while you're playing it but once you stop playing you don't necessarily think that much about it I recommend this to fans of space set action adventure I can only speak to extras on Disney Plus since that's the streaming service that I could access it on. It has no extras where comparatively most MCU movies have good stuff and some of them have a lot. If you, you know, I, I in 2007 I apparently had access to the DVD. I don't remember any of the extras anymore, but back then I apparently thought that there were good extras, but yeah. But, but yeah, so depending on your country, you may be able to stream this on Disney+, Plus, you know, which is an interesting kind of thing, since originally it wasn't made by Disney, it was made to compete with Disney, same as some of Don Bluth's other movies, but Fox, you know, it was, it was, yeah, it was owned by Fox, and Disney bought it. Did they buy all of Fox, or just a big chunk of it? I forget, but yeah. You know, you you know, just like the very recently released anime, you know, Dis Simpsons animated special with Loki points out, this is what happens when Disney buys Marvel and Fox. I rate this seven scattered remaining survivors of Earth out of 10. And that brings us to the thoughts sections. So, thoughts sections start. Disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your knowledge may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of this is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section. Once I get into the rest of the video itself, with that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion on the movie may be in this section. I realize this is very long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So, I am only spoiling this movie. I might bring up, you know, other stuff that's relevant, but I either will not spoil or, or I'll verbally warn right before I do so and hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead if you want to avoid the spoilers. Instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here that I love every line they put in the IMDb quote section, so you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. So, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some is analysis, some is MST, MST3 and Riff and other jokes. Yeah, there will definitely be some jokes in the 
section right after this one. So there are time codes for all the different sections in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts about how while watching in chronological order. You can pick up the same running commentary by tweeting on the way. The section after that is thoughts about before watching. And that will probably be all of the different sections. So And notes taken while watching. I'm, I'm just very briefly going to talk about, so Akima, you know, Wikipedia straight up calls her Kale's love interest. She does have backstory, she does have personality, she does get to be a badass. She does get saved, but she does also, let's see, she does also really kick ass in action scenes. It's a bit of a, a mixed bag. Now, I had forgotten that we actually do see Corso at the start when Kale was, when Kale was a child. I like that Kale doesn't just put up with the bully. He fires that blast of the cutting gun thing he has after him. I just like them to kill my food before they serve it to me. Well, you know, this year the food's improving because the little black things in it are not moving. And Kale catches the plates and food Spider-Man style. I mean, seriously, was that where they got the idea for the Sam Raimi movie? For, for that move, I mean, because it's... Or, or did they just both get the idea from the same third source, maybe? I really love Kale's sarcasm, the whole bit that ends with him saying, I think we got a hug. I could have been on that. I think we got a hug. The gravity generator is a nice bit of setup and payoff. First we see that it malfunctions sometimes. Then when there's a fight, of course they disable... Of course it disables it with his gun. When they're trying to fly away when the dredge attack... You know, we're talking less than 20 minutes in. It is extremely tense when Kale is struggling to get back into the ship before it's too late. And then they finally go out into space and the glass cracks and then they have to briefly float through space into the ship. At first, the... Corso and the others assume that, you know, the, the birds that they see have killed the, I, f I have to admit, I forget how they pronounce it, was it Gaul? I'm going to go with Gaul. Rather than that they are the Gaul, nice little bit of expectation subversion, cliche dodge. We expect intelligent aliens and fiction to look a lot closer to humans. These are basically birds with a little... You know, it's a tiny bit of humanoid traits, but like, they don't, they they don't talk in any language the humans can understand. We humans can understand this. Almost outed myself as a robot there. And the the, let's see. Did they have fingers on the? They do kind of have hands, don't they? But. Yeah, they they really they're they're more alien than human. I really appreciate that. It takes a while for Kale to understand the character telling him, "Hold up your hand." You know, he he's like, "Uh, oh yeah, wow, wow." And and the thing's like, "Oh, for the love, hold up your hand." I'm I'm showing you what to do. You need me to draw a freaking diagram? And we see 
on Kale's hand, the 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 map kind of lights up, and it's some sort of golden compass. And the guy will pick up our crew so they don't have to run, but they can be blown away from the dredge. And we see that the go will actively use the, the balloons as weapons very, very well. And the dredge are trying to get Kale alive so they can use him to find the Titan. The entire sequence with the flying Let's see. Yeah, our crew flying with the go will is very intense. There are a lot of instances where our heroes seem to be in a situation where they will die. And less than halfway through the movie, Akimo and Kale are prisoners of the dredge, and now they know where the Titan is. So we all love the scene where Creed poses as a traitor of slaves and the guard turns out to be too smart for him. I don't really have anything to add. I just want to make sure that you know that I love it too. It's it's such a great scene. The dialogue, the little details, like it's not just that the guard says, no, there's something wrong. No, he specifically says what was it? You if if you really were a traitor, you would threaten me. That guy's not a slave. He's the the way he's moving is is military. He's not his will, that man has not had his will broken. And you are wearing a bet sheet. And Creed is loving being able to kick and punch Corso. You know, a good 30% of the audience wishes they were that guard when Stiff kicked him with her powerful thighs. Don't look at me, I'm just reading the room. And Kale gets out of the electrical force field just by using his fingers. It feels too easy. I don't know exactly what should have been, you know, but just like first he puts one finger through and runs it up, and then he puts two fingers through in different spots and moves them, and then he can get out and just, yeah, I, I don't know. And the, you know, the crew get to Akima, and we see that she handedly beat up all of the aliens around her pod. Like, she couldn't get out of there because it's locked from the outside, but she beat them up with ease. So that's, yeah, that's again a nice cliche, cliche dodge, sub, uh, expectation subversion. You know, she's the woman, so we expect, oh, she must be in danger, and they're going to come, and she's going to be like, oh, thank God, you, you got here in time, I was so afraid. No, no, they get there, and she's like, you, you sure took your sweet time. I had to beat up all of these guys by myself, and that was honestly boring, because it was so easy. Akima, open the cargo bay. I'm sorry, Corso, I can't let you do that. I know, I know I do it every time. Because it's funny every time. That's why. Really cliche that Akima and Kale almost dying means that they now hug when they meet back up. And when other people are looking at them, they pretend to be more casual. I mean, it wasn't necessary to have the rock songs literally spill out. Spell the yeah. Has the fit that? I'm just gonna start. I mean, it wasn't necessary to have rock songs where the lyrics literally spell out the situation. It's my time to fly, and earlier there was the thing with I'm a loser. Just, yeah. I do like that Kale does get to fly now that he came. Yeah. Of, of course, they weren't going to let him when he was a child, and... You know, early in the movie, it was also, he didn't know enough about the situation for it to be safe for him to fly, but now it does make sense for him to fly. That really is a horrifying nightmare he has of the dredge coming in and killing him. It's also pretty cliche that both Kale and Akima get to be near each other when the other is naked, unexpectedly or against their will.
and it is ridiculous. The course I was secretly working for the the dredge, and Kale and Akima realize this because he's shouting loudly about the plan, arguing with the dredge with the, and and the door was like slightly open and everything. It's just like. If they were going to be in contact, if Corso and the Dredge were going to contact each other, why would they do so in a way that's that easy to just, yeah. And, it, like, that scene is one of the screenwriters throwing their hands into the air and saying, I want to go home. I have been here for so many hours. I want to go home. I want to hug my wife. I want a few hours of sleep. So this is how the scene is going to play out now. And it's just, it doesn't make any sense for Corso to be working, you know. What exactly does he, so, so I guess the idea is supposed to be that if he helps the Dredge find and destroy the Titan, then they're just not going to care about humanity anymore. Like, it just seems like, Hypothetically, if I were Dredge, and I were like, and, and I knew that there was a human that came up with the idea to team up with their enemy so that the enemy would leave them alone, I would think to myself, the reason he wants that is he wants us to leave him alone so he can invent something to use against us. You know, it's just, it's, it's really bad writing. And Kale and Akima flee Creed and Corso. And Kale, you know, blo he, he holds the, the door open with this grate, but he lets Akima go through before him because he's no longer as selfish as he was at the start. So. I saw someone defend the, like, for a lot of the movie, Goon speaks, like, he's, he uses calm, like, he, he talks normally, he talks, but then, like, for the, near the end, here near the end of the movie, when Kale and Kim are no longer on the, the Valkyrie ship, Goon start talking somewhat more simply. I think it might be that he's sad, like, that... Like, maybe that's his species' version of crying? You know, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, like, maybe when his species cry, it doesn't mean that tears come out of their eyes. It just, like, like, if you're crying and you're trying to talk, you sound different than when you're talking and you're not crying. So I think that might be what they're going for here, that he doesn't cry tears, he cries in a way that makes him talk in that other way, but I don't know, maybe I'm rationalizing. Every time my brother kicks that ball, he, ima it's, he imagines he's in a big grass field. That's some imagination. I bet he could even imagine the Super Bowl without Earth. Or so on Creed, I can't believe it. Really? Because apparently a lot of viewers saw it coming a mile away. They say. I really don't think it's that obvious. Now, let's see. And Kale and Kima, Akima, you know, and a few others, fixing up, montaging, fixing the ship is ridiculous. How long has it been there? And they just happen to not be short any important parts. Like, it's just, yeah. I don't think that kind of thing had to... Like, I, th I think that something like that could maybe have worked. But then it should have been, let's, yeah... 
let's say that at the start of the movie, Kale is like frustrated because he still he's he's short that one really important part. He's been saving up money, but you know, and and he actually he has enough money to buy it. But the guy, the the alien that told him that he could buy it there was just claiming that he had it because he was hoping to sell him something else. So now you know, Kale has this money, but he doesn't have that part. He has he doesn't have any way of getting that part. So he's never going to be able to get away from this salvaging dock place. And then Corso comes in, and he does have that part, and they're able to fix it, and then the rest of the movie happens. But the idea that this ship that's been there for a really long time, I'm not saying that, you know, I get that if there just wasn't anyone else there who had the know-how on how to fix that ship, of course they wouldn't be able to, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you can't fix the ship. And maybe there just wasn't anybody else there who knew how to fix the ship. But the idea that there isn't a single piece, there, there's no part of it that has to be replaced with a part that they don't have on hand, and all this, it's just, yeah. I really love the whole, the, the bit near the end of the reflections. You know, Akima realizes that Corsa was following them because of the reflection, and... What's it called? Yeah, the, the Corsa is having trouble figuring out where Akima is because of the reflections, and Akima does manage to sneak behind Corsa. Right like a... I appreciate that the movie lets the solemn moment of the realization that Kale's father is dead sit instead of rushing ahead. In general, the movie knows when to rush and when to slow down. Goon, are you alright? He seems to die, but he wakes up later. There is a bit too much in this movie of plot armor. Like, the only major characters to die are Creed, Corso, and the Dredge Queen. And... Like, okay, Corso redeems himself in his death, but when Preed dies, we know that he's evil, so, you know, it's not that big of a deal for a mainstream movie to kill off its villains, you know. This is a movie where these characters are constantly in grave danger. Even after everything, Kale still tries to rescue Corso when Corso is about to fall. But yeah, I, I quite appreciate that Corso gets to redeem himself after. Yeah, it's very clever the to power the the Titan by using Dredge energy. I think I saw at least one. YouTube review would point out that basically the dredge, like because of the dredge, it, it became a self fulfilling prophecy. The dredge were terrified of Earth being a threat to dredge because of something they would invent. So they tried to destroy the the invention that seemed most likely to be the thing, you know, Titan. And in trying to destroy the Titan. The, you know, the dredge got so close to the Titan that their energy could be used to power the Titan. And that, you know, if, if the dredge had not cared about the Titan at all, the, you know, the dredge might never have been harmed by the Titan. But because they kept trying to destroy it, you know, yeah, so, so that's a good, that's a clever way to, to deal with that. Kale, you're a sitting duck up there. I'm alright. Did all right change meaning to dead meat in the thousand years between now and when this movie set? I have finished my nap. Expectation subversion cliche dodge. Cause it is like you think it's this dramatic death scene, you know, and he said he was gonna nap. You know, usually in movies when a character says, I'm so tired, I'm just gonna 
I'm just going to close my eyes for a second. You know that that's, they're about to die, you know. It's like their brain is trying to make it easy on them. But he said he was going to nap. He napped. Great visuals on the dredge energy being used to power the Titan. It wasn't the greatest idea in the world to end the movie on the lame joke that the plan really is going to be called Bob. So, that brings us to the next section. Notes taken before watching. Yeah, so the the um, the YouTuber Meromorphic points out that the dredge are not the real antagonist, it is feelings of hopelessness, which I thought was a really good point. I I hadn't put that together on my own, but that is absolutely true. And yeah, I guess that actually is those are all of my written notes. Yeah, that's that's everything I had so that was that was an incredibly short final section but yeah everything else got put in other sections so I almost forgot again I've written a proper sign up now if you like this video please comment thumbs up and subscribe there should be a link to my main channel page one, two, or more links to relevant playlists on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, and currently they tend to come out very similar to this one. So, if you want more like this, you're in luck. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.